A blessed and pleasant good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ, and welcome to another edition of Morning Prayer brought to you by the Anglican Diocese of Belize. Today is Monday, the 27th day of September, and September is almost behind us. Can you believe it? Oh my gosh, just like that, then October, then November, then December, and 2022. Mm. It's a slightly overcast day. I see some sunshine on the horizon through the window across from me there, um, but it's made Mainly overcast I see in the north there is some gray um, but you know what we're gonna be okay it's gonna be a lovely day just the same it already is a lovely day we're gonna kick things off this morning with one entitled today I awake let's have a listen <laughs> A lovely one there entitled Today I Awake. 
We'll continue this morning then with getting our words up on screen for today, September the 27th in 2021. And here we go. Aha, there we are. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Words from Psalm 122, verse 1. This morning, if you are following along in your books of common prayer, we are on page 35 using versicle 1. Blessed be the Lord our God, by whose grace we are yet alive. Blessed be his Son, Jesus Christ, by whose rising we are set free. Blessed be the Spirit of God, in whom is our hope and our joy. Our invitatory prayer. Father, we come together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, to offer you our worship, praise, and thanksgiving. To you belong all power and glory. You are the source of all goodness. Let our worship bear witness to your peace and saving power. Through your spirit, may we ever rejoice in the abiding presence of our risen and ascended Lord. Amen. Our first canticle for this morning is the canticle de Jubilate, which is based on Psalm 100 and can be found on page 37 in our Books of Common Prayer. O shout to the Lord in triumph all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his face with songs of joy. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who have made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Come into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his holy name. For the Lord is good, his loving mercy is forever, and his faithfulness throughout all generations. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. At this time, we pause to call to mind those things that in thought, word, or deed we would have committed that would have been displeasing to God, that would have been unjust to our neighbors, or perhaps would have been unkind, even to our very selves. For these times and these moments, Lord, we pray to you for the forgiveness of our sins. Together we pray. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life, which you have made known to us in your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. At this time, we will have the reading of our psalm, and our psalm for this morning is Psalm number 89, and it is going to be read for us by Miss Darlene Gentle. Let's have a listen. The psalm appointed for this morning is Psalm 89, verses 1 through 18. If you're using your book of common prayer, it may be found on page 486. Psalm 89, verses 1 through 18. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever, with my mindfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant, David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne through all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord. Your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? God fared in the council of the holy ones, great and awesome above all that are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is as mighty as you, O Lord? Your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. 
You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you created them. Tabor and Hermon, joyously praise your name. You have a mighty arm. Strong is your hand. High your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Happy are the people who know the festal shout. Who walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. They exalt in your name all day long and extol your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We want to thank Miss Darlene for leading us in the reading of our psalm this morning. And we continue with our second canticle for the morning, the canticle, the Benedictus, which is based on Luke chapter 1, verse 68 through to 79. Blessed are you, Lord, the God of Israel. You have come to your people and set them free. You have raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of your servant David. Through your holy prophets, you promised of all to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our forebearers, and to remember your holy covenant. This was the oath you swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship you without fear, holy and righteous before you all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way to give God's people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine upon those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. At this time, we have the reading of our Bible lesson, which comes from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 17, verse 24 through to 41. 2 Kings 17, 24 to 41. Let's have a listen. A reading from the Word of God, written in 2 Kings, chapter 17, verse 24 through to 41. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria, in place of the people of Israel. They took possession of Samaria and settled in its cities. When they first settled there, they did not worship the Lord. Therefore, the Lord set lions among them, which killed some of them. So the king of Assyria was told, the nation that you have carried away and placed in the city of Samaria do not know the law of the God of the land. Therefore, he has sent lions among them. They are killing them because they do not know the law of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, Send there one of the priests whom you carried away from there. Let him go and live there and teach them the law of the God of the land. So one of the priests whom they carried away from Samaria came and lived in Bethel. He taught them how they should worship the Lord. But every nation still made gods of its own and put them in the shrine of the high places that the people of Samaria had made. Every nation in the city which they lived. The people of Babylon made Sokot Benoth. The people of Koth made Nergal. The people of Hamath made Ahshima and the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartak. The Sepharavites burned their children in the fire of Adram Melech and Anna Melech, the gods of the Sepharvim. They also worshipped the Lord and appointed for themselves all sorts of people as priests of the high place, 
who sacrificed for them in the shrines of the high places. So they worshipped the Lord, but also served their own gods, after the manner of the nation from whom they had been carried away. To this day, they continue to practice their former customs. They do not worship the Lord, and they do not follow the statutes or the ordinances or the law of, or the commandment that the law commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. The Lord had made a covenant with them and commanded them, You shall not worship other gods or bow yourselves to them or serve them or sacrifice to them, but you shall worship the Lord. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt with great power and with an outstretched arm. You shall bow yourself to him, and to him you shall sacrifice. The statutes and the ordinances of, and the laws and the commandments that he wrote for you, you shall always be careful to observe. You shall not worship other gods. You shall not forget the covenant that I have made with you. You shall not worship other gods, but you shall worship the Lord your God. He will deliver you out of the hand of all your enemies. But they would not listen, however, but they continued to practice their former customs. So these nations worshipped the Lord, but also served their carved image. To this day, their children and their children's children continue to do as their ancestors did. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Be to God. If you afford me a couple of seconds here to get back to the beginning of our reading, and here we go. Let's get it back up on screen. Aha! Our reading is from Second Kings chapter 17, verse 20 through 2 to 41. And the last time we were together. We were all the way in Second Kings chapter 9, and now we are in chapter 17 of Second Kings. And it's interesting because we would have missed quite a bit, yes? And just a brief overview, um, in Second Kings chapter 10, there is a reform. You remember in chapter 9, we got a new king by the name of Jehu, and that Jehu executed Ahab. And then in chapter 10, Jehu continues with his reform, and he executes the house of Ahab. And so the descendants of Ahab um, and Jezebel are executed at Jezreel. And then in chapter 10, the reform of um, Jehu continues, yes? And let me tell you, um, the man is cleaning up house. He is not making sport. Anyone who is against the Lord is just not being allowed to continue. Of course, the young king, Joash, who was reigning over Judah, yes, he, of course, had sided with King Ahab and he had... Well, he was not doing too good in terms of following the example of his mother and um, his grandmother and her sons were dead. And so he became the official royal heir and he was hidden in the house for six years and they were hiding him because they didn't want that Jehu would come and kill him. Yes. And the kingship came to him after he came out of what we are going to call an exile. Yes. And he was an anointed king. And the truth is that it wasn't until the death of the queen mother, Athalia, that Joash is then hailed as the rightful heir. And you know what? While he was young... Joash did many reforms in his time because he was not a part of the temple worship of Baal. And when we said Joash was young, Joash was seven years old when he became king. He was, I mean, really and truly, really and truly, seven. Imagine that. But yet still, I guess because of his I'm going to call it infancy, but seven is not really an infant. But uh, Joash and then King Jehoash, you know what? Um, the two is believed by theologians to be the same. 
and even as a young king, yes, he who reigned for 40 years more, Joash, Je Joash Jehoash, if they call him so, he brought about a series of reform. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And it's interesting because he will see prosperity because of this. And he goes around and he gathers money and he repairs the temple. You know what? But then he gets in a position where the king of Syria, Hazael, is about to attack Jerusalem. And he takes money and he goes to pay tribute to Hazael. And this marks the decline of his kingship. The truth is that Joash is going to be assassinated. Yes, the king of Syria didn't really like, you know, they resulted in disaffection from, from Hazael. And even though they had kind of tried to bribe him to not attack them, it didn't really work out that way. And then, of course, Elisha, the prophet, also dies in that period when Joash is king. And so the kingship is lost, yes, and the prophet is lost. And so in that time now, Jehu also is going to be lost. And Jehoahaz, Jehu's son, becomes king. But despite all the good that Joash is doing in his kingdom and all the good that Jehu did in the sight of his son and the people, Jehoahaz, Jehu's son, does what is evil in the sight of the Lord. And he falls into the steps of Jeroboam, yes, in terms of his idolatry. And let me tell you, because of this, they are delivered into the hands of Hazael, the king of Syria. And you will notice that every time the people rebel against God in terms of not worshipping him as they should, they find themselves losing their battles. Yes. And in the midst of all of this, Elisha becomes sick and he dies. Yes. And God had used Elijah on many occasions to heal others, but he didn't heal Elisha himself. And King Joash and Elisha had their final consultation with one another. And Joash, of course, cried greatly for Elijah. Yes? And Elisha was taken by chariots yes, and horsemen. And he, he was going to, Joash wanted to create a fight really with, this, with the Syrians, not the Assyrians, with the Syrians then. And he came to plead to see if the prophet would give him a blessing. Yes. And the prophet told him, okay, take your arrow and go and, and strike the ground three times and do what you must do. And Joash fails to take the full opportunity and the prophet became angry with him and yeah. After three wars, he loses. Elisha is dead. But the power of Elisha and this one I hoped we would have been able to cover. Elisha, even after his death, yes, they buried him. Even after his death, the men <laughs> went to the tomb of Elijah and they touched the stones and the bones of Elijah. Yes. And then they got, I guess, boldness and an unusual miracle. Yes. But then through the power of the bones of Elijah, they were able to heal and bring to life those who had um, died in battle and those who had been wounded by touching the bones of Elisha. And that is an interesting read in the um, in chapter 13. If you go read the, 
chapter 13 of second kings when you read the death of elijah and the use of his wounds and then i began to wonder if that is where the prophets of today talk about using the sweat of the prophet to heal and things like that since elijah's bones could not anyhow in second kings 14 there is the reign of Amaziah and Jeroboam the second and we already know that these guys um they come from a lineage that isn't going to do what is right but or didn't do what is right but then Amaziah the son of Joash yes he tries to do what is right in the sight of God and he brings a little bit of restoration but Amaziah's obedience will not last very long but during his obedience he has victory over several people he has victory over um, the Edomites and he then enjoying his victory is defeated at the hand of Joash of Israel because remember the nations are still divided and they're coming into battle with each other and Joash the king of Israel sent to Amaziah the king of Judah saying you know what um give your daughter to be son for my wife and there was an emphatic no and that created war and um yeah the result of of Amaziah's foolish war against Israel was that um Israel captured Amaziah and his kingdom and yeah so that caused the people then to fall back under the rule of um, a king that was not after the heart of God. And there was then instability in the monarchy in Israel. And that, of course, huh, if the kingdom is not secure, the people can rise no higher than the leader. So if the leadership is uncertain, if the leadership is not with God, then you know that the people will not live in peace. And then between Second Kings 15 to where we are in Second Kings 17, there's going to be a rapid succession of five kings. Yes. And it's the final overthrow of the kingdoms of the tribes. And it's all about the, the corruption and disorganization that made them easy prey for Assyria. And of course, by the time we get to chapter 17, the Assyrians have taken over and the Assyrians, um, the fall of Israel has happened. Samaria is, is taken down and Hosea is now the king. And Hosea is an evil king. He, listen, let me tell you, he did evil in the sight of God, but not as the king of Israel who were before him. And he was by no means worse than the kings of Israel. But his bloody overthrow of the preceding king and his violent ascent to power did not make him unusually evil among them. And Hosea had he tried to resist against the against Assyria, but couldn't because he was not walking in the way of God. And so finally, the northern kingdom of Israel is conquered by the Assyrians. And what the Assyrians did then would become brain drain. Yes, they would take the people and exile them to different places, leaving the poor and, and, and the impoverished behind. And then what will happen is that they take other people that they have captured and bring them into Israel. Yes. And the people who were left behind, when they are met now with these, I'm going to call them aliens, when they are met with these aliens from other lands, they come then, foreigners, that's a better word, they come then in contact with these people from, we're going to, the Bible calls them from a godless nation. Yes? And instead of walking in the statutes of the nation whom the Lord had commanded or the way the Lord had commanded, they began to take on the practices of these godless nations around them. Yes? And some in secrecy and some openly practice idolatry. And we know that the one thing that, that God is really, really against, I mean, is if you put something ahead of him and they built altars to these foreign gods and they rejected the repeated warning of God. 
Yes, the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah through his prophets. Because remember, Elisha had a house of prophets. Yes, and he kept telling them, turn away from your evil. Keep my commandments and my statutes according to the law, which I commanded your father. And then you can, you know, be restored. But they kept rejecting his statutes and his covenants. And so they kept finding themselves in, in difficult places. And then we find ourselves in... Second Kings chapter 24 to 41, which is finally our reading for today. And what is going to happen? In the resettlement of Samaria, God warns the foreigners who are settling in Samaria, you don't belong here. You are not our people. You do not know our ways and customs. And so the Lord sends lions and the lions, of course, attack the community. And these are not like figurative lions. These are real lions that are coming to eat up the <laughs> eat up the people. And it's interesting that the Lord sent lions to eat the people who do not belong. It sounds harsh that the Lord would try to wipe them out that way, but we have to understand that all of creation is at the command of God. Okay? Eh? All of creation is at the command of God. And when the people of God are living against the will of God and God can't reach them after several warnings, God can reach the other things in nature that he has commanded. Yeah, that he has created, that he has dominion over. And he can use those things in nature to try to bring back his greatest creation into form. Yeah? And the king of Assyria, having brought people, they came with the policies of the Assyrian Empire. They came as a rebellious, resistant people. They did not know the Lord. And so lions attacked because they were doing foolishness in the Lord's land. Yes? And it shows that there was not something special about the kingdom of Israel. Yeah? Not only was there something special about the kingdom of Israel, but there was also something special about the land of Israel. Yeah? It's not about the kingdom in as much as this is the promised land. And God demanded to be feared among whoever lived in the land. You remember when he said, you will teach it to your sons and you will teach it to your servant girls and to your slaves and your hired hand that everybody who comes in the land must live according to my law. And that was not happening. Israel was the holy land. It's still called the holy land. God, re God regarded it as something special and would hold accountable those who lived there who did not live according to his laws. Yeah? And so God asserted his own right and sovereignty over the land through the pouncing of people with these lions. And the Assyrians didn't know how to worship God because they come from Assyria. They, they have no concept of the God of Israel. And so the officials seem to have a moment of lucidness and clarity. And they said, you know what? These people don't know what to do to praise the God of this land, which is why they are doing, they are, they are, they are being punished this way. Yes? Send somebody help help and the king of Assyria when he heard this he decided okay send one of the priests that we have taken in exile let him go there and live there to teach the people who are now living there the laws of the God of the land and that's not a bad idea that was an excellent idea it was an excellent idea because okay if they don't know we can teach them and if we can teach them and they begin to practice, then maybe the calamities that are befalling them will change. Yes? And so the priest is sent and he goes back into the land and he gets there. Yes? And he is living in Bethel and he is teaching the people how to worship. And the people are receptive. The people are receptive, but still in their willingness to do what will save their life. Yes? Because they're doing it 
because they are concerned for their safety. So they're not doing it because they actually want to build a relationship with God. They are doing it to save their own hide. Yes? And that is an important thing to notice. Because they are going to worship God, but in the midst of the worshiping of God, they still worship the false gods that they are used to. And really and truly, you can't fault them. Yes? You can't fault them because their way of life was their way of life. They had been uprooted from their country and put in a new one. Yes? And when you think about it, you remember Daniel? You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They were uprooted from their country and taken into exile. And even while in exile, when they were told to worship the false gods, they didn't. They continued in their faithfulness to Yahweh. And so it's the reverse that is happening. Now you are taking people from foreign lands and bringing into the promised land. And when they get to the promised land, yes, they didn't know. Yes, they are being taught. But still their own personal traditions and customs that they are used to, they still practice. And so even though the priest was teaching, every nation still made gods of its own and put it in the same temple that was supposed to be attributed to the worship of God. And it gives us a list in verse 30, yes, true to verse 32, that each man came bringing their own God that they were used to and worshipped alongside Yahweh. And so it's a half-hearted thing. Let me tell you, if you're doing something to save your skin, it means you're doing it without sincerity. It means you are not fully committed to what you are doing. Full commitment and sincerity has a different face than doing just because. And I'm going to make some enemies here now because for me, I recognize that truth when I was a student being taught. I had teachers who came in and they were on fire and they were prepared and they made the lesson exciting and they want to make you learn. And you could feel that it is a love for knowledge and a love for the imparting of knowledge that motivated them to teach. And then you had some who came who evidently were covering the basic minimum, didn't create any kind of excitement or interaction and seem to be there simply to collect the paycheck. And don't feel bad. It happens in offices. It happens in schools. It happens in churches. Where people do the bare minimum in order to get by. But don't do with a passion that which they, they say they want to be doing. And so the people... These foreigners living in God's land. Yes, okay, we excuse them. They don't know we're going to teach them. And they come and they do what they are taught. But they are not doing it out of sincerity of heart. They are doing it because they're afraid for the lion. And you can't half serve God. And it's a scary thought because then when you think about it, the smallest things that displease God could be seen as half served in God. And we are human, so there will be many things and many times where the 100% of our sincerity is not there. Someone asked me about two weeks ago, have you seen? <laughs> and I had to chuckle and I explained to the individual, I probably sin more than you. Whether intentionally or not, I probably sin more than you. Rev, you not afraid? Came the next question. Because when I think I sin, I'm afraid. I say, well, yes, I'm afraid when I sin. And when I realize that I have sinned, I become very fearful. But then the thing is, my fear causes me to run to God and say, God, i sorry I realize that I have done wrong. Help me to not do wrong again. And I don't say it knowing that I will go back to the same sin. I say it 
actually hoping that by the grace of God, I don't find myself having to come back to tell him I'm sorry for that same thing. So I'm afraid when I do sin, but I'm also faithful that if I tell him I'm sorry and I lean upon him, I might not find myself back in that same situation. And praise be to Jesus, if I do find myself back in that same situation, I know that as long as I'm willing to confess my sin, to admit that I am wrong, and to try again, that his love will be there. But the foreigners in Israel didn't see that. They thought, hey, we could juggle both. I mean, up to the killing of their children was a part of their idol worship. They burned their children in fire to worship the false gods, Adra Melech and Anna Melech, man and woman God. Yes? How could they think that the burning of their children would be accepted in the sight of a God who they then came to worship and offer animals as sacrifices? See, it reminds me of the tongue being the two-edged sword, one side to bless and one side to curse. And it shows the duplexity of humanity, but it also shows the, necess the necessity of choosing. Choose, day, choose this day, Jesus says, who you will serve, God or mammon. Whose side are you on? And you remember, that is the question that, that um, was asked by Jehu when he looked up at Jezebel. Who's on my side? Who's on, well, not my side, but who is on the Lord's side? And that's the question. If you are on the Lord's side, then you have to live like you're on the Lord's side. Will you get it correct 100% of the time? Absolutely not. Mm -mm. I don't get it that correct 100% of the time. But if you say you're going to walk on the Lord's side, then lean on the Lord's side. Lean into the things that will reflect the character and nature of God. And in our gospel reading yesterday, we heard the men of God who were leaning on the Lord's side, getting upset when they saw somebody that they thought was not on the Lord's side. And what did Jesus tell them? Nobody who is doing good in my name could talk bad about me. Because when you're on his side, there's a certain nature and character that comes out of you that is in stark contrast to the negativity and the, the darkness that exists in those who are not on his side. Because that duplexity can't exist. And in the children's show yesterday, Muki said it best. You have to choose whether you're going to be salt of the earth or you're going to be salty on the earth. Salty means your behavior is not right, yes? But salt means you're giving light and life and seasoning the world with the flavor of Christ. Because of their duplexity of worship and their insincerity of heart, the people of Israel at the time thought that we could do this and please God because we deserve and like they say we're supposed to. But they weren't doing it with, with sincerity. And so what happened? They didn't worship the Lord. They didn't follow his statutes. They didn't follow his laws and ordinances that he commanded the people who live in that land as they should. And because they didn't, then they continued to experience the negativities. Yeah? And it's interesting to note that one, you can't say one thing and live something else. You can't do that. And it's also important to notice that God expects of his people, no matter where they are and no matter who they are with, that they are going to serve him. That's it. I've seen instances where, and young people, I see it with young people. I work with young people a lot. Yes? We go, we were in Ohio 
with a group of young people and we went into a restaurant and we were about to eat and I said, okay, who will lead us in prayer? And the first thing a few did was look around to see who else was in the restaurant. And I smiled and then one young person said, I'm a prayer rev and we all bowed our heads and we prayed. And when we had finished praying and we in the middle of our eating, a couple that was there came over to our table, asked us where we were from because they heard that our voice, our accents were not the same and then said to us, thank you for praying over your food because people are afraid to pray in public now because it's not welcomed anymore. Yes? And I explained to the young people, you see, you can't be afraid or ashamed to keep your commitment to God because your commitment to God will be the fuel that encourages somebody else to continue. So we can't be like the foreigners in Israel. We can't act a certain way when in Rome, do as the Romans. Uh -uh. When in Rome, remember that you're an Israelite, you're chosen by God. Live that way, which is what Daniel did, which is what Shedrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, which is what saved them from the hands of their enemies. Because no matter where they were, they were gods. Where you are is not important. Whose you are. Is where the value lies and i tell people all the time if as i am i am not enough for god then i don't know what i will be and what you see is what you get because i believe that following christ having a relationship with god through jesus christ that's not a practice that's not a hobby that's not a on a sunday thing it's a way of life and if it's a way of life it is how you live each day. Do I get salty? Sometimes I get salty. Ask anybody from Christ the King or anybody from any of the parishes I've served in. Sometimes I get salty because I am human and I pray hard that God would grant me the patience and the peace I need in order to deal with a lot of the stupidity that exists in the world. So I do get salty. But I try to rinse away my salt in order to be salt <laughs> duplexity of heart and spirit cannot exist if you are the lords you are the lords and if you are the lords then you will act and live as if though you are <laughs> so we're gonna stop being salty and we're going to start being sought. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue then with the profession of our faith. In the words of the Apostles' Creed. I get in trouble for that one, you see. Yeah. Together we profess our faith saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son of our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. As our Savior has taught us, so let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. For our suffrages this morning, we use suffrage C on page 44. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day, we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy. 
<clears throat> Lord, show us your love and mercy. For we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope, and we shall never hope in vain. Our first collet for this morning is the collet for proper 21. Let us pray. O oh God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace, that we may we running to obtain your promises may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Together we say a prayer for the poor and neglected. Almighty and most merciful God, we remember before you all poor and neglected persons whom it would be easy for us to forget. The homeless and the destitute, the old and the sick, and all who have none to care for them. Help us to heal those who are broken in body or spirit, and to turn their sorrow into joy. Grant this, Father, for the love of your Son, whom for our sake became poor. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, we turn to our personal prayers of intercessions and thanksgiving. This morning, we would like to extend birthday greetings to the following individuals. Celebrating a birthday on Saturday was Mr. Ignacio Rosado, Mr. Errol Williams, Ms. Beverly Pascasio, and Mr. Clay Lean, as well as Ms. Lisa Green. Celebrating a birthday on Sunday was Ms. Darlene Belgrave and Ms. Courtney Young. Celebrating a birthday today is Ms. Eudine Cooper and Mr. Antonio Puerto. We pray, ladies and gentlemen, that you will have a blessed and beautiful birthday today and that in these, God's blessing will be upon you, not just for your birthdays, but for all the remaining days ahead. Happy birthday! We continue to give Almighty God thanks for persons who have recovered from illness and surgery and we continue to pray for healing and recovery for the following individuals. We pray for Miss Judith, Miss Monica, Miss Margaret, Miss Mary and Miss Bernadette. We pray for Miss Ines, Miss Eileen, Miss Sylvia, Miss Rita and Miss Tisby. We pray for Miss Pauline, Miss Des, Miss Janice, Miss Marva and Miss Loretta. We pray for Miss Rose, Miss Sonia, Miss Aislin, Miss Dylan and Miss Marcia. We pray for Miss Grace, Miss Justine, Miss Alma, Miss Chris, Miss Celestina, and Miss Kim. We pray for Miss Celine, Miss Allison, Miss Leslie, Miss Jessica, and Miss Arlet. We pray for Miss Maria, Miss Soila, Miss Crystal, Miss Lashana, Miss Norma, Miss Beryl, Miss Amelia, Miss Althea, and Miss Geraldine. We pray for Miss Mary, Miss Janet, Miss Olga, Miss Anisetta, and Miss Glenda. We pray for Miss Marilyn, Miss Nina, Miss Ilona, Miss Dominique, and Miss Eve. Pray for Miss Verolyn, Miss Elena, Miss Donna, Miss Caroline, and Miss Mariani, Miss Julie, Miss Abelina, Miss Catherine, and Miss Harris. In our prayers, we continue to pray for the following of our brothers. We pray for Mr. Zane, Mr. Larry, Mr. Kenrick, Mr. Wilfred, Mr. Marvin, and Mr. Philip. We pray for Father Eric, Mr. Glenn, Mr. Rudolph, Mr. Finley, Mr. Costa, Mr. Oscar, Mr. Freddy, and Father Hardy. We pray for Mr. Charles, Mr. Walter, Mr. Eliseo, Mr. Rupert, Mr. Enrique, Mr. Ian, and Father Constancio. We pray for Mr. Ismael, Father Jerry's, Mr. Dudley, Mr. Dion, Mr. Alfred, and Mr. Ian. We pray for Mr. Michael Samuels, Mr. Michael Soberanis, and Mr. Michael Griffith. We continue to remember and pray for the sick and shut in members of our various parish family, and I ask your prayers especially for those of the Christ the King parish family. We continue to pray for Mr. Eds, Miss Elva, Mr. Austin, Miss Amy, Mr. Alfonso, Miss Myrtle, Miss Jean, Miss Gladys, and Miss Ismay. We pray for those who care for the infirmed, praying for Miss O, Miss Linda, Miss Joyce Lynn. Miss Marta, Miss Sonia, Miss Monica, Miss Margaret, and Miss Raquel. In our prayers, we continue to pray for comfort for those who are grieving the loss of a loved one, for those who were 
killed over the weekend, for the family of those who were killed over the weekend, for the family of those who succumbed to illness or disease, especially those who died as a result of COVID-related illnesses. We continue to pray for comfort and peace for those families. And we pray as well for comfort and peace for the family of Mr. Ashton Ramirez. We pray for comfort and peace for the family of Miss Cynthia Armstrong. We continue to pray for comfort and peace for the family of Miss Gilda Franklin, for the family of Mr. Udell Bennett, for the family of Mr. Reginald Courtney. Indeed, we pray for comfort and peace to be upon all those who are grieving the loss of a loved one, and we pray for return and rest for those who have died. We continue to ask for God's protection over our loved ones who are far away from us. We specifically pray for our students, Tammy, Anwa, Karina, Courtney, Akua, and Ashley. We pray for our loved ones in the military, praying for Emil, Jade, Charles, and Barry at this time. We pray for Drs. Molina, Manzanero, Shogreen, Arana, Joseph, Sosa, Koyar, Nurse McKin, Nurse Gill, Nurse Herrera, Nurse Arel, Nurse Cherie, Nurse Joycelyn, Nurse Alberta, Nurse Aaron, Nurse Alejandra, and Nurse Bolivia, as we pray for protection and enablement of all our medical professionals in the performance of their duties. We continue to pray for healing for persons who are infected with COVID-19, those in the various isolation wards. We pray for the ready availability of a cure or vaccine, and indeed we pray for the containment and elimination of this COVID-19. In our prayers, we continue to pray for the combating of the economic fallout caused by this pandemic. We pray for those industries most severely hit. We pray for persons who would have lost employment. We pray for persons whose salaries would have been reduced. We pray for all who are struggling to make ends meet at this time. We continue to pray for the most vulnerable in our society, for the poor, the needy, the elderly, those with pre-existing health conditions. Pray for God's provision and protection over them. Pray for God's discernment and peace, his guidance to be upon the members of our security forces, over the government, persons in positions of public trust and authority, the churches, church leadership, the private sector, and all non-governmental organizations involved in the fight against COVID-19. We continue to pray for the members of the international community who presently suffer as a result of this COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, we continue to pray for protection for ourselves and our region against the ravages of natural disasters. And we remember those who are on the road to recovery, having experienced a disaster of any kind. For the prayers of our hearts that our tongues cannot confess, pray that Almighty God would end prayers. And we conclude our intercession by praying together. Almighty and eternal God, sanctify and govern our hearts and bodies in the ways of your law and the works of your commandments, that under your protection now and ever may be preserved in body and soul through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. By means of announcement, brothers and sisters, I want to thank you so much for joining me for morning prayer this morning. It is indeed a blessing and a privilege to be able to greet the presence of Almighty God um, and the blessing of a new day in your presence. It's a blessing indeed to be able to see a new day. There are those who did not make it through the night, who did not make it through the weekend, and we continue to pray for comfort for their families. I want to thank those of you who joined us for Sunday Eucharist yesterday online. And we want to thank the bishop and the online ministry team, all those who made it possible for us to be able to worship together, even though not in person. Um, there's something about in-person worship that I love, not because I'm the priest and I get to stand in the front, but there's a deeper sense of fellowship knowing you are nearby, no? But yet still, I am extremely thankful that in the absence of that, the online ministry team, the Bishop, Mrs. Wright, and all others who are a part of that ministry team do all they can to make sure that we have a sense of fellowship still when we can't be beside each other. I'm grateful for that, and I, I want to give them thanks. And I want to thank you 
for supporting the work on the Ministry of the Anglican Diocese of Belize because we could do this all day, but if you are not participating with us, then our efforts are in vain. So thank you so much for your continued support. I want to remind you of our broadcast schedule for today. Today is Monday. And so following this, we have noonday prayers at midday. This will be followed at 2.30 by Children's Bible Minute, where the children will continue their look at the sacraments. We are currently on sacrament number six today of the seven. Mm -hmm. So that will be at 2.30 and then at 5.30 we have evening prayer and this will be followed by compline at 9 p.m. to close off the day. I know, I know, you may not be able to join us for all of these services, but please join us for any that you may be able to join us with. Yes? And of course, again, thank you for your continual support of the ministry and the work of the Anglican Diocese of Peace. We're going to wrap things up this morning with our prayer of dedication followed by the grace, the dismissal, and then our final hymn. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light to our paths, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and to serve our persons in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to close off this morning with one that says, Though I may speak in the tongues of men and of angels, if I have not love, noisy symbol or a clanging bell, God does not look forward to the duplicity of spirit. He expects, expects us to be salt and not salty. I do pray you have a blessed and beautiful day. Until tomorrow morning, same place, same time. Do all you can to keep yourself and your family safe. God bless and bye for now. Thank you.